Excellent. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of AMO Pharma Limited. The myotonic dystrophy type 1 is a genetically determined rare disease. It's caused by a trinucleotide expansion repeat of junk near DNA near a certain gene called DNPK. And that trinucleotide expansion repeat of repeating DNA units is coded. It's transcribed and produces a repeated RNA, uh, uh, an RNA that has a CUG repeat many, many times, and hundreds if not thousands. And that repeat has no normal physiology. It does not occur in a healthy individual. And it's present within the cell where it can bind to some key proteins that are essential for the normal function of those cells within the organs of the body that they make up. And as that expansion repeat is passed down the generations, it's the, the term is anticipation, it gets bigger. And as it gets bigger, the symptoms become more severe and start earlier in life. So typically a family who are affected in, in a sort of stereotypical description, maybe the initial person who has the condition has rather mild symptoms that begin in their retirement years. If they have children, their children will begin to be impacted somewhat more severely in a disabling fashion in their 20s or 30s. And if they have children, their children will have a child with onset form that could be diagnosed at birth. That could be very, very severe, life threatening in the neonatal form. In terms of where this RNA exists, it, it occurs in every organ system of the body. So an, a, a difficult feature of the condition is it can affect your muscle functions, your arms and legs, it could affect your heart muscle, it could affect your gastrointestinal tract so that you have digestion issues it can affect your brain so that you have cognitive issues many individuals with the condition will have heart in issues for example so it has a widespread but very variable effect it could affect any organ but doesn't affect every organ in every patient all of the time so it's not like having high blood pressure, where you have one thing wrong with you and one thing that needs treated, you have multiple concerns that are very difficult to manage and disabling for anyone who has a diagnosis. The AMO02 is what we call a traditional low molecular weight pharmaceutical. It's a kind of a standard drug rather than uh, a more complex or advanced biological kind of agent. It's not a gene therapy, for example. It's prepared as a strawberry flavored liquid, so you can drink it or administer it through a feeding tube. And, and we need to have a liquid because many people who have congenital myotonic dystrophy or the adult myotonic dystrophy form have swallowing and choking hazards as a function of their condition. Once you take it in by mouth, it will distribute to every organ of the body. We have very good evidence that it will penetrate brain, skeletal muscle, heart muscle, liver, GI tract, and then it will get into the cells of those organs, and then it will do two things. It will remedy the abnormal function of one protein that is being attacked or constrained by the RNA, but it will also separately bind directly to the RNA, and in binding to it, trigger its destruction. So it is both rescuing some of the impaired proteins, but also causing the RNA that causes the condition to be disrupted and removed. We've actually run two studies to date. We did what we call a phase 2A, which is a small pilot study, what we call an open label study, where there was no placebo control in adolescents and adults with the congenital childhood onset form. And we looked at various different outcome measures and saw a rather broad effect that came on quite rapidly over a 12 week period. That, that was in no way definitive, but that was enough to encourage and inform us to do 
What was the first placebo control trial by a sponsor in myotonic dystrophy and the only trial to date in children with a congenital onset form? So we ran a study in children aged 6 to 16 with congenital myotonic dystrophy that took place in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. We targeted to enroll uh, just over 50 kids, which we got. Um, half of them had placebo, half of them had the drug in a double blind fashion for a period of five months. And then everyone was offered the option on completion of the study to um, transition to a safety study where everyone gets drug and they're monitored for at least a year. There were various different options available to us to assess the potential benefit of the compound. And we had no precedent to guide us. So if I, if I sort of cluster them, we picked out kind of measures in various buckets. We had what we call rating scales, where either the clinician at the site conducting the trial or the caregivers scored the severity of symptoms on a kind of naught to four scale, as it were, or similar things. Then we had functional measures of muscle function, like how fast, how long does it take you to walk 10 meters? How strong is your grip? If you grip a, a handheld device connected to a computer, that kind of thing. Then we had computer-based assessments of cognitive skills because the children, you know, are, are noticeably cognitively impaired. And then we had functional biomarkers, things you can measure in the bloodstream that objectively reflect where tissue is. And we had to make our best guess. And after a conversation with the FDA and investigators, experts in the site, we made the primary outcome assessment a clinical rating instrument. At the end of the trial, we determined that what we saw on, the, on that primary outcome measure was a large placebo effect. So people were accrediting benefit to all of the patients, more or less. And if you've got a big placebo effect, you cannot interpret whether or not there was an effect of the drug itself on performance. So then we had to devolve back to some of the secondary and exploratory outcome measures. Those did not generally show a placebo effect, so we could interpret the, the data. And I, I'm trying to remember, I think we had 12 other outcome measures and looking at how many people responded on them, on 10 out of the 12, people responded better if they had the drug than if they had placebo. So there was a very broad base uh, where we could see, you know, where we had interpretable data, it was very clear that the drug was doing better than placebo. We then looked at outcome measures that were representative of lots of different things. So muscle function, hand function, walking function, uh, CNS function, and did more detailed analyses. And again, saw significant benefits, clinically and statistically significant benefits um, in all of those domains. So we were able to improve these kids' thinking skills, their walking speed, the strength of the muscles in their hands their overall formal measures of their overall capacity in the real world, their daily living skills. Uh, and we did various statistical techniques to show them. We then presented it to the FDA and basically just asked the question, you know, what, what, what should we do next? What's your advice? And it was a great meeting. FDA has a couple of people who've invested a lot of time coming to understand myotonic dystrophy, which is great. The meeting had everyone from the FDA, all the decision makers were there, which was, you know, really good for us. We were really pleased about that. And they understood what they had done, we, we had done in the interpretation of the data. And what we agreed at the end was we didn't hit our primary, so they're not going to be able to approve us for the kids right now. But we agreed a program going forward where we export all of the outcome measures that worked in that study or their nearest analog. If, if there's a child version, we would do the adult version. And we will run another study in 
the adult onset form and then submit the totality of the data asking for an approval for everyone. It's tough. I mean, you can you can achieve what we achieved in the study we just completed and I just described with some homogeneity because we only picked people who had a documented diagnosis within one month of birth. So we're getting very specific people. But even there, by the time they're 6, 12, 16 years of age, they're beginning to diverge. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the adult onset patients who show problems for the first time in their 20s or 30s, then it's going to be very disparate. And then what we're going to have to do, and again, we discussed this and are continuing to discuss this strategy with the FDA, we're going to have to pick something as the primary outcome measure, a test of walking, a test of hand strength, make sure everyone has a deficit in that at baseline so there's something to treat, but then back up any benefit we see in that one specific thing by looking at other outcome measures, measuring other things. You know, I, I, I think I would struggle. I'm not putting words in their mouth, but if I were FDA and I saw a company turn around and say, look, we picked all the people who had distal issues with their hands and we showed a statistical benefit. I think if I was FDA, I'd say, yeah, but you know, what happened to their thinking, what happened to their cardiac function, what happened to their ability to perform in the real world, you know, you, you've got to have some secondary outcome measures that are supportive of the meaningfulness of a statistical effect on your primary. So it, it's a complex design and the, the IDMC meeting, which was held in the Netherlands this April, was really devoted to how do you navigate that? And I'm not sure anyone has a 100% complete answer now. Um, it's, 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 it's a real challenge, hmm. but we're getting there. I think we will have a design what we will announce quite soon. And, and I think the other challenge is if you want somebody who is sufficiently impacted to um, have a baseline deficit on your primary outcome measure, you won't get that in isolation. Right? They're going to have other issues. So if you then set all your inclusion exclusion criteria to say, I want someone who walks slowly, but has perfectly normal heart function, perfectly normal liver function, has no GI issues, does not have diabetes, there won't be anyone you can recruit. Now, there's a couple of papers out there that point to the fact that the majority of people with adult onset myotonic dystrophy have like 60% of their lab values are not normal as a function of their disease. So again, how do you, you've got to navigate that one too. It, it, it's, it's an interesting conundrum for people interested in clinical trialology. How grateful we were for, you know, it was super difficult for these families. I think it was something like 65% of the caregivers of the individuals in our study were impacted themselves. And it's hard to go through a trial. It's hard to put your child in a trial, to put a severely impacted child through a trial when you are impacted too was a, a tremendous honor. So I'd just like to pass on my gratitude to those families.